Kia ora e homa, comrades. It's magnificent to be here with you all tonight. For those who do not know me, my name is Sibel Locke. I'm a labour historian and I work in the history department at Victoria University and currently I'm the chair of the Labour History Project. It feels an incredible honour to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Labour History Project, a vibrant organisation dedicated to fostering New Zealand working people's history. It is our 30th anniversary this year. It was established in 1987 and it is truly remarkable, I think, that we survived 30 years of neoliberalism yes. Yes. and that we're still going strong. And I want to acknowledge all of you, past and present, who have made the Labour History Project what it is. And so I want to acknowledge and to celebrate you all tonight. One of those people is Lisa Saxon, who after a long illness died on the 27th of October this year. There will be a larger celebration of Lisa's life in the new year, but we do want to acknowledge her here tonight. Lisa, we miss you, your astute observations, your throaty laugh, your sense of humour, your commitment to social justice, and your wonderful history work on communism. I think about you often as I draw on your work to piece together the communist life of Bill Anderson. You were so incredibly helpful sharing your research on the Working Women's Alliance and such an excellent tutor to work with in the history department in 2008. We send our love to Peter and the rest of your family. Speaking of communists, <laughs> I want to acknowledge another great woman who worked with the Labour History Project, Rona Bailey, who we organise this event in honour of every two years. She was part of the original crew who established this organisation and the Labour History Project committee celebrated her 90th birthday together in 2004 only months before she passed away. As David Grant writes, she was a woman who bestrode both left-wing politics and theatre in New Zealand for more than 60 years. She embodied her politics. She was active in theatre and in dance. She was a member of the Communist Party from 1943, moving on to the Workers' Communist League when the party became too removed from the rank and file. Hey, Joe. <laughs> she was committed to the anti-apartheid and the anti-Vietnam war movements, the peace movement and Pakia treaty work. But tonight I particularly want to acknowledge Rona's commitment to women's equality. During the 1940s, she alongside Mary Boyd, Kate Ross, sorry, yes, Kate Ross, worked with the Wellington section of the Public Service Association and their leader at the time, Jack Lewin, to campaign for women to become permanent members of staff rather than hired temporarily until they were married and to be appointed at equal rates of pay to men in the public service. They achieved permanency for women workers in 1947 and the marriage bar was eradicated. And in March 1948, women were granted maternity leave of six months without pay. Rhonda Bailey also worked with other left Labour and communist women to form the Women's Charter Movement. The movement emphasised democratic education, supporting international unity and vigilance against fascism, the right of women to enter all industries and professions, it advocated daycare centres, workers' holiday homes, home and nursing aids, midday meals for school children, equal pay and opportunity and training and promotion, the end of exploitation of women as cheap labour. They insisted on the right of married women to work. 
Rona was also part of the women's committee that led the Public Service Equal Pay campaign beginning in 1954, which they won in 1960 when the Government Service Equal Pay Act was passed. So it is in that fine tradition of feminist activism that I want to introduce our guest of honour here tonight. Therese O'Connell, longtime Equal Pay advocate and entertainer. Therese was involved as an organiser with the Clerical Workers' Union for 15 years. She was the Women's Representative on the Federation of Labour and then the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions Executive. <coughs> she was active with several socialist and communist organisations in many social justice campaigns and has never stopped fighting for equal pay. She's a full-time feminist who has been involved in social justice as an activist in Wellington since the early 1970s. And here she is to speak and sing, along with her friends, about what still rucks her up. <laughs> well, Kate Mila Vulture, I was asked whether I needed a microphone and I thought, no, I don't think so. And I hope that people down the end will be able to hear clearly tonight. Good. Isn't that wonderful? That's the legacy of being in a rather a large family. <laughs> I, I, rather a large, we're going to show a few photos. Sometimes it will, um, sometimes it'll be pertinent, sometimes not. But nevertheless, I have a few photos to show with tonight. So anyway, when I was asked to do that Rona Bailey Memorial Lecture, I at first was honoured and then I was incredibly frightened. And I have remained incredibly frightened for quite a long period of time. Um, strangely enough, the idea of giving a lecture was so weird to me, and probably extremely weird to you as well, that eventually I got my head around the fact that I wasn't the lecturing type. <laughs> Put it this way, I don't actually think that I have a lineal bone in my body. I think I have a very natural postmodernist, I say that to the <laughs> PhDs in art who are in the room, that I am definitely arboreal in the way I think. <laughs> and I was lucky to learn that. I'm not even going to say where I got that from because I don't know how quite to pronounce delusing Gutari. <laughs> For those who know of feminist, of no art theory. It's amazing, I'm sure, to the number of you that I'm even able to talk about such things. But I did in my 50s do a Bachelor of Visual Arts and Fine Arts and it really upped my game like nothing else, I can tell you. <laughs> so anyway, what, when I was to asked, you know, what, I was, I was actually told I could talk about anything. That's actually a huge thing, isn't it? Can you even imagine, what do you want to talk about? So I, I consulted a lot of people, um, as is my want. I love to, you know, try and share my anxiety with as many people as possible. And I actually think I got the very, you know, you take this seriously. This is your chance. To be serious, I tried to explain to my friend who said that, that I've always been actually serious, I just don't show it. Or do I? It's a question to be asked, isn't it? How, how do you know that you've been taken seriously? Anyway, so then I thought to myself, well, hell, I've got 66 years now to mine. Well, 66 years that I've used up so far. And I thought about my ancestors, and I thought, well, let's, because your ancestors always have to come into it, well, they do for me. And I thought to myself, oh my God, with my ancestors arriving, if I just take it from the ancestors arriving in Aotearoa in the 1860s, that's about 141 years that I can mine, that I can talk about. So the last few months, it's been an extraordinary time in my head. And I'm very glad that this will be coming to an end after tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, uh, nice to see you. <laughs> so, anyway, I will be looking down here anxiously from time to time to see if I'm actually anywhere near what I wrote down that I was going to talk about. <laughs> so, I was going to talk about the ancestors, but I, I will talk about them later. But I think 
what I decided in the end was that basically I needed to have a quick look at the sort of what what actually made me into an activist, basically, because I think that's an interesting thing for anybody who has taken up active, an active life, who, who want to be involved in social justice issues. It's quite interesting once you get older, because at first when you're 18, as I was when I first started, came to Wellington, it felt like it was all just coming out of me. Uh, of course, I had no real understanding that the me was actually part of a long history, which I'm going to give you a little bit about without completely boring you about my family history. Anyway, but I also thought it's quite interesting and it's a bit freaky to actually list the names of the organisations that I was involved in, all the campaigns, and I tried to do that and it made me look, I thought to myself, oh my God, it makes you either look like a nutter or a... Uh, or what? Or just incredibly busy. So I like to think of it rather incredibly busy, rather than a complete nutter. And of course, a number of the organisations that I was involved with and movements had short lives, beautiful short lives, and some of them lasted longer. So when I looked at them, I thought to myself, so I looked basically at between 1970 and 1990, and I'll tell you why I got to 1990 a bit later on. <coughs> so I thought, now what, when I came to Wellington, because I will tell you a little bit about what happened before I came to Wellington, but when I came to Wellington, I joined the Progressive Youth Movement, the Socialist Club, the Catholic Society up at Victoria University. Actually, I have the honour of being, um, what's the word for it when they kick you out? Kicked out. Not from the Catholic Church, but from the Catholic Society. <laughs> at Victoria University because of my views. Um, I then, of course, it was 1970, if any of you here, and there's a few of you here who remember that. Some people have read about it. Others actually lived it. And for me, it was neither a case of um, it being the 70s and therefore the drugs and the alcohol have not worked on my memory because I never did any of that very straight-laced person. Instead it was the, the mobilisations against the Vietnam War, the anti-war movement, the uh, Spartacus League, I was a member of that, uh, Daughters of the Anarchist Revolution, well it's written down somewhere that I was a member of that. Actually, it didn't exist, it was kind of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a good joke at the time because <laughs> when you think, I think there is, is there a right-wing American organisation called Daughters of the Revolution. Yeah, so that was what we did, Daughters of the Anarchist Revolution. And <laughs> didn't know anything about anarchism, still don't, I'm sorry, but nevertheless. <laughs> so then I became, so then it was mobilisation against the Vietnam War, anti-war movement, uh, anti-apartheid movement, Oasis, everyone remember that? Some of you? You know that? Good. Organisation against the SIS. Ah, ha, ha. Uh, local Body Officers Union, Clerical Workers Union, Wellington, Marxist Leninals Organisation. See, I've outed myself at last. <laughs> All those years I've been a secret member of the Wellington Marxist Leninals Organisations, followed by the Workers Communist League. Some of my friends in the front row might never have known. I kept trying to sell them, and they bought the newspaper. <laughs> Often. They were very, very kind. <laughs> they weren't going to join, but they were very, very kind, and they. But one of the reasons I always said that I was a secret member of the, those organisations was because if I'd been a public member, someone would have had to maybe have asked me what was Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate to sound as if I'm thick because I don't think I am, but actually it didn't completely matter to me. <laughs> because I had a vague idea of what it was. I wasn't interested in that argument about particular strains. So I have actually probably belonged to anarchist organisations, uh, Trotsky organisations, uh, Marxist organisations, uh, communist, which probably is Maoist organisations. And I have to say, 
that they were a fabulous organisation to be involved with because they were full of fantastic people doing what I believed was great work. For me, that is what my belonging to those groups were about. So, one that I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight, which was Working Women's Alliance, doesn't get much press, but it was a very important organisation for a number of us, and that was probably in the mid-70s. What else? Women Against the Cuts, Trades Council Management Committee. And also, I was the doorkeeper at the Trades Council. That was a very important role. I don't know if anyone else has ever been doorkeepers. It was, it's one of the things that I'm very, very skilled at. I love doorkeeping because you get to say hello to everyone coming in and that's always interesting. So you get to know a bit about people and you get to be the person at the back watching the interplay. And that is always fascinating too if you like watching people as I do. Now I also belong to another I'm going to out, I'm sorry about this because I didn't mean to out myself. I'm, I'll try not to out anyone else here because of course it's all very important that people have the right to out themselves, I say. <laughs> so I'm only outing myself tonight but an organisation that people don't know about as well which was pretty important at the time because it's CLAM. Have anyone yeah. heard of CLAM? <laughs> CLAM? Yes, celibates' lives are meaningful. <laughs> that was a very important organisation. Wasn't it Marion Cadman? <laughs> it's kind of not the organisation that you actually want to join. But sometimes you feel yourself to be in a position where you are you need an organisation to support you during that time. And that was a very important organisation. Actually, to me, one of the issues that I would love to see discussed at some time is the whole who fucked who and who was paying <laughs> over the years in the Wellington left. It would be so interesting. <laughs> and it's wonderful how history now allows you to say these things. It's a bit like when he's saying capitalism and everyone's oh god he said that word because people don't talk about capitalism anymore i thought oh my god i might be able to reveal now that you know i come from the working class i mean really how exciting is that to be able to regain some of those words anyway so i've also belonged to the labor party and currently I belong to the Wrong Tow Women's Branch of the Labour Party. There you go. That's for you, Sue. She'll be around trying to get you all in. <laughs> it's a terrible thing. H Block Committee ourselves. I'm going to stop that because, really, I'm stopping at 1990 because, well, that's when the SIS decided they were going to stop surveilling me. <laughs> <laughs> More about that later, okay? <laughs> so, this is a much longer introduction than I actually planned. That was the first page. God, you've got 80 pages to go. <laughs> How are you going to stand it? Oh my God. Okay, I just want to, I want to acknowledge my ancestors. Who are we up to? Oh, Mum and Dad. Oh, Mary and Monica's first day at school. Isn't that gorgeous? So you can... You can kind of get a picture, can't you? Most of you can tell by the name Therese Francis O'Connell. <laughs> There's a few things you can guess. I, people, older people used to look at my face and say, oh, I know where you're from. And I think, oh, yes, it's the potato face. It's for certain. <laughs> <laughs> but the name certainly helps it. And there we are, those beautiful family of origin. My younger sister, see the babies in the front? Those babies are turning 60 on the 1st of December. We still call them our babies, not to their faces, of course. And, um, and this will be a gathering without parents now. They lasted as long as they could. What's the next one? Oh, this is, I thought to myself, when we were talking about songs, I thought, oh, buddy. Um, because when I think about my life, I know that songs have been very important to me. And for many of us, we're the generation that music actually and songs started to talk to us about what we believed in. Um, and and it, it became more universal, it wasn't just us. So here we are. This is my chance. This is what I used to do when I first came to Wellington in 1970. 
hand. Found myself at a party, in the kitchen of course, because that's where I like to be, or in the corridor or the passageway near the toilet, that's an interesting place also. <laughs> don't get invited to those sort of parties anymore, don't know why, maybe my age, I don't know. I'd rather be sitting somewhere probably. But this was a song when everyone started to sing, because we did used to sing, that, and I want to see how many of you can sing it. This is a song that to me speaks quite a lot of volumes as to why I would have become an activist. And it's a Catholic hymn, but it's not a hymn in the sense of a sweet thing. It is an Irish, really, a song. Teresa, are you going to sing it with me? We go like this. And I'd love to see people who know it sing along. We don't only just do it going a couple of verses. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon fire and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we about oppression and dispossession. Um, they were all people who came to New Zealand, so they either became landowners, they were working people, a lot of them. And so that was our legacy. It wasn't talked about enormously because of course those generations, it was just seeped in. I mean, I found out when I uh, became a union official and I went to um, I went home to New Plymouth and I met New Plymouth's only known communist, Ernie Miller. Anyone remember or know of Ernie? Ernie Miller was uh, the only known communist in New Plymouth <laughs> and he was married to a Catholic woman and um, he told me, he was a member of the New Zealand Communist Party and later on the SUP, he told me that when he was a young man selling New Zealand, the People's Voice, he used to sell it regularly to my grandfather who was a Scotsman and a cook and he said they had a lot of good conversation about politics. Well, I didn't know that. My grandfather died when I was four, but obviously in your family you get ideas and attitudes that carry on. So, again, so of course it was also post-war. And in that period of post-war, um, you know, <coughs> so many changes were going on. Um, and of course, having a Catholic background, it also helps you, it gives you lots of plenty to rail against. 
I now call myself a recovering Catholic in the belief that uh, you can't really say you're not a Catholic, as I tried to from the age of 18, because that is like saying, it's not, you, you have to admit that it's something that you spent many years being indoctrinated in. And so therefore, your whole value system is based in so much of that. So, you know, that's something we learn, is it not, as you get older, that actually your value system's placed in a very, very young age. You can attempt to change it. Um, so I now call myself a recovering Catholic, and I kind of like to have that as one of those uh, census title so that more and more people get to, uh, we, we might actually develop a party out of it or something. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a party, but you know, there'd be a lot. Anyway, this was Build Stories and Song, so let's have a song that was happening at the time in the 60s, because again, some people here remember the 60s, and the 60s were, of course, Times we're changing, but we're not going to do Bob, and he's not coming in to sing with us. And actually, I know that people were giving out sheets of paper that had song. If I had a hammer, we decided uh, most recently not to sing if I had a hammer. But we thought that. So I'm sorry about that. You were given a false thing, and you, you might like to sing if I had a hammer on your way home. <laughs> and of course, you know. I was thought it was about our family. My father was a carpenter, so but it did make sense to me as well. So there we go. And of course, the late sixties, we had we didn't get a television until nineteen sixty-eight. Um, that was a huge year at that time. There was so much happening. Television was showing us the world. Uh, things happening in Paris, America, the civil rights movements in America. Incredibly, it still makes me really emotional when I think about those times seeing that and thinking how unfair that's where you know the unfairness of it. And I think it, it moved a lot of people. So, the song we're going to sing all together, probably <laughs> is that right, girls? Because here comes the feisty, feckin' full time feminists yeah. um, who are going to we're going to sing, We Shall Overcome. Are you all ready to sing? <coughs> because they used to be, because I don't <coughs> sing, I sing on my own note, um, so I have to sing the note and then they play it, so it's good, isn't it? Are you ready? <laughs> we shall
and it's worth seeing it again actually, I think. Um, I'm sure people are. Right, so where was I? What have we got to in the pictures? Oh, we've gone past, that's the year, that's my grandfather, my Dolly, I put that in so people do believe me. I have a dog called Dolly, and she's named after my grandmother because my I'm named after both my grandmothers. That's why it's Therese Francis O'Connell. Francis is from the Polish. Dad's side, Therese is her second name, but she was known as Dolly when she was a barmaid. Because her surname was Gray. She was a barmaid um, in Auckland during the First World War. I think there was a song about Dolly Gray. But anyway, for some reason, that was her barmaid name. So my last dog, my latest dog, I thought, well, you know, too late to have children. <laughs> it honours my grandmother. <coughs> so I always think of her as my grandmother. I don't think she thinks of me as a granddaughter. <laughs> anyway, where am I up to and what is the time? Because I am talking a hell of a lot. Could be six already. Time goes, isn't it? <laughs> Anyway, I was just going to tell you a little bit about um, not only when I came, when I came to um, Wellington, uh, I came to be, I was going to be a teacher. That would have been nice, I think. But actually, when I arrived, um, I realised that it meant that I had to live in a hostel. Uh, or it was all set up to live in Helen Lowry Hall, I think it was, in Karori. And... Um, I suddenly thought uh, I'd met up with a guy that I knew from Francis Douglas, which is one of the schools I went into in New Plymouth. You don't maybe not know that, but I'm very close to Bowdoin Barrett because he's another, you know, <laughs> that, that's my, my claim to fame. You know, I went to Francis Douglas. That's just because, you know, sister school, sacred heart, you know, all the rest of it. You don't need to know all that stuff. Anyway, so uh, a Francis Douglas boy, not Bowdoin Barrett, um, was in the progressive youth movement and um, he, he said come along and it seemed the right place to be um, and so I got involved. You know, thought, oh that's fab. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, it's all right. I, I'm really not doing at all what I thought I was going to do. There we are. There's some demonstrations in 1970 at the Cenotaph um, and this one over that side is the process in 1970. <coughs> Just when Nixon, you remember the, the Kent State murders? Um, and we, overnight, um, Tama Puata um, was the Communist Party person who was the youngest, I think, in the Communist Party. So he was involved in the PYM to keep an eye on us young ones. And um, who didn't really know that everybody else in the world thought that the PYM was a Communist Party organisation. But, you know, we didn't think we were, but anyway. Um, Tom had the truck, he was a driver, and overnight we created those, they were the names of the people who were killed, and we wanted to put them into the Proceg March, which was on that day. Uh, and we were told, no, because Proceg is not political, of course. <laughs> so um, we did, we just, we were at the end of the parade, that was all. Um, and. Yeah, we did a lot of things like burning effigies and they were scary, scary things. They were, they were it was an interesting. Russell, um, yes, Russell, he's not here tonight, did a film about the PYM that, it's a long time, so Russell Campbell, well, thank you. Um, not Russell Marshall, <laughs> that's right. Um, and it was an interesting move and it certainly got us to do, um, got me completely out of my comfort zone um, and, you know, lurking around at night time, burning effigies up against fences and all those sorts of... People think it's adventurous, but actually it was scary. It was, you know, you do have to have a bit of gumption or, or you just have to be spurred on or there might be somebody in the group that you fancy that makes you want to <laughs> go out in the middle of the night. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't my story, but, you know, I know that that might have been other people's stories. I've always had that belief. Anyway. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so anyway, I went to work because I came with very little money. Um, I had spent all my, you know, I, I think I've probably done, you, you see the picture, I went to work every uh, weekend, after school, during school holidays, 
I worked to save money to come to Wellington because I knew Wellington was where it all happened, and of course it's true, isn't it? So that's what I did. And I came to Wellington, I got a job at this um, Victoria Cafe, and in the cafe, the Student Union Cafe, uh, for the first time in my life, and this was really interesting to me, this is when I understood about equal pay. I had no idea until that time that women were paid less than men. And that sounds a bit weird, but for certain, it just wasn't, it must have been out there, but I did come from New Plymouth, you know, and it wasn't a highly political town. Um, but also because women work with other women, there was no way of comparison. So, you know, I had done work that boys didn't do. Um, you know, kitchen hand, well they probably do now, but they didn't in those days. So I found out that the guy who was working doing exactly the same job as me was paid differently. I thought, what the, you know, I still remember the outrage and I still feel the outrage. Um, and even though we are slowly, is that right, or we, am I being too hopeful? I'm always hopeful, we're, we feel as though we're slowly making moves, things are happening, but it's, we know it's complex. And a lot of people in this room have been involved in trying to achieve equal pay. Um, and everyone's had a different reason to be involved. And I know it's something that I have still felt that complete outrage and continue to advocate for it throughout. However, where was I going? <laughs> oh, you have, good on you, because actually, what was liberation from? So in March, uh, when I was working doing this, I thought, what do you do about it? What do you do about equal pay? And again, coming from New Plymouth, I didn't know about unions. Again, that's not, that's not, um, these days, there are unions active and visible in, reg in regional places, but they don't have a big life, no matter how much people may hope. They don't, they're not central to what is going on in those communities say the same maybe in Wellington, but dare I say that. But nevertheless, so we started a group and because it was at Victoria University and because you could have a free room there, we called it the Women's Liberation Front because we knew that there was fronts going on in Vietnam, other places, and we started. We started to, what happened to us is what happened as many people will be aware of their own things is that because it suddenly was happening all around the world, we were then asked every week. Like for me, it was about equal pay. That's what I was in there for. But every week, suddenly, we were the flavour of the month. You know, we had the women's magazines. Well, actually, they didn't have women's magazines. They had women's pages in the newspapers. <laughs> women's World, if you remember. Um, and, you know, they actually did an article about me, and the first line was resplendent in her purple scarf or something, I've still got that scarf, but nevertheless, you know, that it was like that was the tone of what was happening. So um, in many ways we, were, we felt, and I talked to Claire Louise about this today because she was involved with Palmerston North at the time as well, that we were sort of making up the agenda and, and the policy as people were asking us, like for example, they, you, a, a journalist would say, what do you think about the abortion situation? Oh, say, well, we'll talk to you next week. We'll have a meeting. Um, so back to the weekly meetings, you know, you get into those weekly meetings. What do you think? Let's discuss it. Let's work out what we're going to say, how we're going to do it, etc. So that's how we grew to have particular policies. Some of you have been involved in those things. And in 19, 12 October 1970, I always remember that date. It was my birthday. It was the day I turned 19. And um, you'll see some people you might remember, Ken Finley. You'll st see him, he'll have a placard down on Island Bay, probably about the cycle way, isn't it, I think, <laughs> at the moment, from the uh, Meat Workers Union. I'll engage you down the bottom there. Um, Fran Codd, who was a journalist um, at Parliament. And there's Lisa, Lisa Saxon. Women work, academics talk. Wendy Prophet, Kate Goodger. Adia Hannah, myself, Louise Reynolds, Shona Abernathy, and I'm sorry, but Vinnie O'Connell was standing beside the Women's Liberation Front on that time, and it's just been cut out. 
So, um, there you go. Not because of any family feud. <laughs> Just the way I was trying to manipulate the photos. So there you go. That's an equal pay demonstration. Um, and in the same year, I know that's very good and it's a good movement because I can, you know, dribble on. So um, that is the era that out came. Do you remember? 1972, 73, I think. I think you're all going to have to get a good song in here. Are you ready? Start low. Start low? Start low. <laughs> so that's hard. I think I'm a natural high pitch voice. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try and start low, and if I'm not, you can just shout at me, okay? So. <clears throat> I am woman, hear me roar, love is too big to ignore, and I know too much to go back and pretend, and I've heard it all before, and I've been down there on the floor, no one's ever gonna keep me down again, oh yes, I am when it comes to this. I just um, thought that I'd better tell you why, as I said, why 1990? Well, actually, it didn't come as a surprise, but this is a parcel now. Oh, that was just here. Uh, in August, I received a parcel, and the weirdest thing was, I, I kind of knew that it was coming because Emma had said to me, you should see if you've got a SIS file. And um, I thought, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, why not? Because she said, you know, her uncle had got one, it was really interesting. <laughs> told her a lot of, told them a lot about his life. And, and I, you know, I had just got involved with the Labour History Project and Richard Hill said it was, you know, he, he's been looking at them and I was really keen, you know, he was quite keen to see and I, oh, well, why not? Now, when it arrived, I was shocked. I, I weighed it. I can't believe that. I did. It's the first thing I did. I went and got my weight watches scale out of the bag, and, which I haven't used for a long time. And I thought it is still functioning. And it was 760 grams. I thought, shit, that is a lot. And in it was that delightful letter, two-page letter, which I'm probably going to see everyone, but. I, was, I thought that was very nice of Rebecca. She wrote me a lovely bit, but, and she told me all about, you know, why, why are you being looked at, why, do, why were you being, and I found out that I was being surveilled from 1970 to 1990. Oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was kind of torn between thinking, and 
I did say to Richard, how, how big was yours? <laughs> <laughs> and I caught myself saying it, I thought, shit, that was a rude thing to say. <laughs> and I thought, well, no, but it is kind of interesting, isn't it? And he did explain that um, a lot of material has not been given to us, that only some of it, so his was obviously smaller than mine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Rebecca said this one thing, and I just thought it was so fascinating. She said, as you read the material we have provided to you, I ask that you bear in mind that the information is in some cases over 45 years old and written in a different era. Some of the reported comments are not of the kind that NZSIS would include in its reporting now. I am sorry if these comments cause offence to you. So I thought to myself, they're going to say I'm fat! <laughs> I mean, what else would, and would that offend me? I don't know. I think I've known that for a long time. Why else would I have dieted my whole fucking life? <laughs> but, I mean, really? So, I looked through to find out. I actually haven't read the whole file. It still freaks me a little bit, and it is weird that it freaks me. I haven't quite processed why it freaks me. I think it's not the fact, because you know, we were aware that they were around, but I didn't ever think that I was really important. I, don't, I still don't think I'm very important. But obviously, it was the PYM, you see, that got, that, um, got me on to them. But anyway, um, no, they didn't. They, they said in 1971 that I was five foot five. I'm really pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever been five foot five. But, uh, um, and, and they said that I was a plump build. That's quite oh. pleasing, isn't it? <laughs> she said it's quite pleasing to be plump. Well, apparently it's pleasing. But by 1983, I had become solid and rotund. <laughs> a coarse, dark version of Mama Cass. <laughs> Bit of a compliment there, I thought. <laughs> Uses very coarse language. <laughs> <laughs> no. What I hadn't understood was that the SIS is also, you know, about being proper and you know <laughs> and making comments. So it, I thought to myself, my God, this is a hell of a lot about the people who were reporting. Actually, I have to say my personal favourite, and I was going to provide this particular treat to you tonight, but then I thought I might have to clean up. But the report mentions that Therese Francis O'Connell, always that full title, attended the Workers' Communist League film evening held on Friday the 23rd of November 1984 and seen devouring copious amounts of the readily available popcorn. <laughs> Was, and I'd like to talk to people who not understand this thing, never mentioned the Women's Liberation Movement or Working Women's Alliance or the Women's Movement and the Trade Union Movement. That wasn't important, obviously. You know, and so that's really interesting, isn't it? So it could say it's because... women in their staff. What's that? Maybe they didn't have... They might not have had women in their staff. The who would have read, oh no, of course it wouldn't have been. I'm not going to judge whether there was a man or woman who thought that I was devouring. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's, I tell you, it's given me a whole new thought about me. So anyway, so there you are. Um, and it also, now someone, someone in this audience might know what this is because they didn't see women's liberation as a threat, obviously, and I, of course, believe that was the the best, the most threatening movement that we've had. Mm -hmm. However, um, and so they, it was reported, though this is the sort of thing that was reported, 
that a farewell party was being held at T Therese Francis O'Connell's home at 31 Matanu Crescent on the 19th of the July, 1977. Mandy, do you remember? Were you? <laughs> who was? Who was going away? It doesn't say who the farewell party oh. was. It you? No. Was it, was it you? Was it Carol? China. Did you go to China then? Yeah. My God, do we have a farewell party for you? Oh my God, you're going to have to go and get your SIS file. <laughs> Just to see whether the party has been mentioned. And I think that's the other thing, isn't it? Is to work out. We might be able to eventually work out who was there. Actually, I don't really care, to be quite honest. I'm sure there are some people who have found it really important that they have been done really good work keeping New Zealand safe. <laughs> Popcorn eating. <laughs> oh, it's just amazing, isn't it? So. <laughs> now, we, we don't have enough time. I can't really go into the clerical workers' union. And um, I'm going to leave. I was going to do stories about the Working Women's Charter, but actually, luckily, Marie Russell is editing a book that hopefully will come out in 2018 which gives you the history of the Working Women's Charter. And believe it or not, I've managed to write a whole chapter. That was a lot of sweat and tears too, I can tell you. But nevertheless, what was great, because my mother kept my letters for years. She was a great archivist, you could say. Other people would have said she just didn't like to let those things go. But it was really great because she kept all the letters over a period of time where I was writing, because I'm the sort of child that people that some parents would hate. My older sister never told my parents anything. I told my parents everything. <laughs> and um, my, I said to my mother once, what was, what was worse? Was that the person who told you nothing and you imagine what was going on, or the person who told you everything? She didn't reply. She's a very <laughs> diplomatic woman. <laughs> so, you know, this, um, we're looking forward to that, Marie, that um, book. And I think it is a really important, the Women's Charter, the work that women um, and men worked to actually pass that charter, because it was a great organising tool um, to, for things. Anyway, I do want to very quickly talk a bit about the Working Women's Alliance, because I think that's another organisation that deserves more attention and its influence in building and educating women, a large number of whom went on to work in the union movement and lots of other things. And that organisation operated between 1974 and I would say probably about 1980. Any other members of the Women's Alliance can remember when we eventually got so burnt out from running teach-ins, uh, all the rest of it that it became, and we started, most of us, to ta start work in the trade union movement, and that takes up all the energy, all those people who work within the trade union movement. Anyway, Sandra McCallum, Christine Gillespie, and Trish Kirk, and Trish is here tonight, they actually set it up, and they set up the Working Women's Alliance to take action on a number of issues, including skyrocketing food prices, provision of childcare facilities, tenants protection, and informing women workers of their union rights. And that actually became, we got a newsletter started in 1975 that actually became a newspaper. Bryony Hales was the editor of that and did a fantastic job. It was called Working Women. And in 1976, it was mailed out nationally to 1,300 people. That was quite extraordinary in those days. Um, there were 200 copies distributed in Wainu Amata itself. Miriam did some of that work. Um, and 200 more in factories in Seaview and the Hutt Valley. So, you know, it, it was all about, um, we promoted the abortion rights campaign, we um, created leaflets, we worked with the Trades Council, we, I don't know we created the slogan, but we certainly made that slogan ours, which was make the rich pay, which I always thought was a pretty good one. Um, anyway, so we also, at one point, had five different, um, we had five cities where there was active Working Women's Alliance groups. So um, that was pretty amazing. You don't hear much about that, but that organisation, which one day someone will write this history of, 
actually seeded a lot of things in the trade union movement and a lot of the women's movement. So we're just going to run through, run, 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 run. You see some photos probably of the FOL conferences, <coughs> our first national women's committee. It's the Irish cartoon, I love that one. That, of course, is what we were, um, I just want to make a quick comment about that, because that's a Cormac as an Irish cartoonist. Believe me, you should drop all the stuff about feminism and women's rights. When we have established a socialist republic, we will take care of all of that. <laughs> have we heard that before? <laughs> yes. Well, we did. And for myself, I actually found that... And one day, one of my, actually, a, a man in the union movement that I had a lot of time for, but, you know, he and I were quite competitive at times. He had an Irish background. Um, and one day, he told me in the day that I was a great working class lass when I was working with him. And then later in the day, when I was arguing with him about the idea of... Um, that the issue of abortion was a workers' issue, was an issue for the trade union movement. He then told me that I was a middle-class feminist. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought that was quite clever of him to have me pigeonholed in so many ways. So, now Lisa, we talked about Lisa before. Lisa was looking at the attitudes of the traditional communist parties in her draft doctoral thesis. And she says at that time, and I think this is something that we had to deal with a lot, the traditional communist parties, the Communist Party of New Zealand, the CPNZ, and the Socialist Unity Party, the SUP, were inclined to view, she said it very politely, we were inclined to view second house, second wave, second class feminism, I was going to say, <laughs> second wave feminism as a rather dangerous trend that could have the effect of splitting the working class. Those of us who had to argue about that for many years. I don't think we have to anymore, he is hoping. Anyway, now the clerical union, I'm not even tempted to talk about that. I just want to tell any of you here who are involved in the union, either as a, um, a member of the committee, if you're a delegate, if you're a member, if you're an organiser, there's to be a reunion. There it is, on the 25th of March 2018, and I think that we also deserve to put a bit more attention to the work that was done within that union over a lot of the campaigns. And I know that Sabelle, you and Grace have been um, doing a fantastic oral history project <coughs> to talk to people, because now that we've understood that history is not just about figures, and minutes of meetings, but actually about real life people's personal stories. And it's a fabulous relief to many of us to know that, <laughs> and to know that you're doing something about it. So I just thought a few photos to show the Clerical Union, both in the anti-apartheid movement and that Credit and Dunn's dispute. Um, so, what is our time like? We really are running out. So I'm not going to sing that song. Okay. Sorry, what about it? Is? Uh, yes, it is good to seven. But I do want to acknowledge that there was, a, you know, for me, the Clerical Union was 14 years of my life and many years of many others was an amazing time. We learnt a lot, we supported each other. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, oh, yes, now, Pinky, you see, I went on 1990 to 1992, but I'm afraid the SAS weren't interested in us. <laughs> <laughs> we obviously weren't doing anything. Uh, but I just thought I'd throw it up there. That's Sharon Murdoch's wonderful. Um, but she's such a great cartoonist, but she was also really good at making cards. Um, and Pinky and I worked together, did more songs, more, took more activity, and she's gone on to have a particularly stellar career and I just couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not that she's gone on to have a fabulous career, but I just could not stand uh, being an entertainer any longer. So again, I had originally planned, I don't know why I thought, I did actually do a quick test run for myself, but I didn't want to put too much, to fright myself too much, to talk to you about the HBOT committee and the information on Ireland. But um, we are running out of time. And um, one day, 
some of you know about the um, age block committee, some of you were involved in the disputes, in the disputes, in the protests that we had in that period of time when, uh, in 1981 when 10 hunger strikers died. Now, um, and actually I saw something in the, I saw something in the, um, in my file that actually wrongly named the film, because they were very interested in that, as you can imagine I've got an intense um, surveillance during the period of the um, age block committee and the information on Ireland. Obviously subversive. Well, we all know that, eh? Anyway, oh, look, there's a freaking feisty freaking full time feminists. We're singing out in 2017 and into 2018. I've got a few cards. I am um, one of the, um, what would you call it? I'd like to promote that particular group. We don't want too much work, but we don't <laughs> mind. And we're very happy about singing um, feisty feckin' songs. So uh, if you ever need that in your office or workplace, in your, in your, in your rest home, in your uh, whatever, you know, we, we can come and do it for you. We don't really charge, so that's even better. So, um, but I'm actually, I cannot go past let me see whether we can go to my new revolutionary work. Oops, there's Friends for Life, Activists for Life. Now, oh, wait a minute, before we go on to my new revolutionary work, see that? I just like that one. This is Cassie Power, who's a friend of mine, one of my brother's ex-partners. Um, and in 1983, that's her and her mate about the abortion law reform in Ireland. And here they are again, 2017, and she says, I can't believe we still have to protest this bollocksology. Yes. <laughs> and what I thought was really fascinating though was then this appeared, thank God for Facebook, isn't it a wonderful thing? Things have changed and things do change because the wider movement is now with them. This is a Sinn Féin meeting and those are all people who are members of Sinn Féin who are supporting the repeal of the AIDS campaign just this last week in the government. So I just thought it's always great to see that period of time that people are keep on being involved, that, you know, sometimes you're winning, sometimes you're going back, sometimes, but you've got to keep at it. Now I'm also aware, oops. Oh, oh sorry. No, that's good, that is it. Oh, sorry. That is so good, because I know that people have to leave. But I wanted to talk to you in a very short play about my new revolutionary work. Now, you remember when smoking was cool and we all smoked? <laughs> yep, some of the people in the room are in that photograph. And you remember that? Rose. Shelley Hiha is not here, but that's Marion Catherine again. She obviously used smoking when she was in clam as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'd say. Now, you see, when I was told I could talk about anything, and a friend of mine said to me, you should talk about what really pisses you off, or what really, and you know, you've got an audience who are listening to you. And I said, but actually half of this audience has heard me talk about alcohol before, <laughs> because I have a message for you. Stop the fucking excess drinking, let me say. Whether you do or don't, I think this is one of the most important things that I am going to spend more time on, and that is to get behind the campaigns to cut down on alcohol being available to young people in supermarkets, etc., etc. <coughs> So I'm saying let's lower the alcohol consumption. Some of you might have noticed that tonight when you came, if you've come to other functions of the Labour History Project, you would have been served alcohol. I put it to the committee that I'd like to have a, a, a function without alcohol. We had quite a good discussion about it. <laughs> <laughs> and actually I have to tell you, this is quite, this is hard work to do, I have to tell you. Because people know that I'm a wowser. And so maybe it comes better from people who have been drinkers, because I've always had this message. <laughs> I've had this message because there was alcoholism in my family. And so I was brought up being told that alcohol was dangerous because it deprived women of money to be able to look after families. It made people silly 
<laughs> in terms of um, violence to women was a greater. So I listened to my mother and I believe her and all my evidence of my life tell me that she was right. I do think that we have to be see this as it is a, an important social justice issue. We've got to try and make more functions no alcohol. We've got to think about our own. This is time for your personal conscience. <laughs> yeah. Is that funny? It's very funny how Catholicism keeps on going. I'm still the missionary at heart. It stays here with you for years. But it is a personal thing, but it's also a political thing. So I've now, I'm, as I say, um, you know, addiction, alcohol, disease, time to make the difference. Those are not the bottles outside my office. <laughs> they are not outside of the village of the park, my retirement <laughs> village. <laughs> they are down the road though, and I just took that the other day. I was walking my darling dog, and I walked past, oh. I thought, shit! <laughs> because um, that is flats in that area, but they're not huge lots of flats. And I thought, do they only put the bottles out once in six months? And I thought, Actually, I think it's every second week, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so I was actually quite gobsmacked, and I was also quite interested, I don't know why, in looking at what types of alcohol people drink. Why should I be interested? I don't care to hoots, you can drink what you like. It's up to you. But um, I was just kind of, not impressed, but a bit shocked by it, I have to say. Something still shocks you. Anyway, what am I going to say? At the end, when it comes to it, I'm, I'm, I'm running it up now. I'm, I'm coming to the end. Look, I've got all these photos, because I did this, and then I have just a few, I know what. So, in the end, what's this got to do with Rona Bailey? Did anyone wonder about that? Because <laughs> <laughs> this is the Rona Bailey Memorial Lecture. Sorry, not lecture. Conversation. Well, at 1am this morning as I was thinking again about what the hell was I going to do, how was I going to do it, blah, 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 and I thought of Rona, and for me she was one of those totally fabulous women. I first met her in 1970, right, fresh from the provinces, there I was out with my mates from the Socialist Club and the PYM and a broad coalition, because I have a photograph of it somewhere, but I can't remember, it's way back. We, went, we were on an all-night vigil. We had our blankets. We didn't know who. It was, it was cold. It was a Wellington night. There was about 30 of us. And suddenly, a sports car turns up. And out of the sports car comes this blonde <coughs> woman, she could have been almost my mother's age. She certainly was older than most of the people at that demonstration. She brought a huge pile of hot fish and chips, handed them out to people, got back into her car and drove away. And it was one of those Tonto Lone Ranger moments. I said, who was that woman? <laughs> and someone replied, that's Rona Bailey, she's a communist! <laughs> well, what an aspirational moment. <laughs> a communist, I knew what they were. They were Rona, they were glamorous, they were generous, they were friendly, they were kind. That's what a communist is. So, I kept meeting Rona over the years. We were comrades in the same organisation. And all I can say is that when I th I'm so glad that there's a biennial lecture that allows people to say and talk to you about all sorts of things. I was just going to start to apologise about my ramblings tonight, but I'm not going to because when I lie down in bed tonight I'll be saying, I'll be thinking to myself, why did you just say that? Why didn't you say such a thing? <laughs> you know, as I say, you never have to, um, you know, you never have to criticise <coughs> when you've got an internal critic that will always tell you <laughs> where you got it wrong, how you got it. I feel privileged to be asked.
to come and talk, mainly because of the calibre of people that have done so in the past. I'm really thrilled to be part of the Labour History uh, Project. I said to them when I first came in, no, I'm not an academic uh, and I'm not a um, historian, but I do see myself as an activist and I want to be committed to that. I don't want to just be a lady that lunches. I, would, I am interested in continuing to be active in all the things that I'd like to be until I drop off my perch. Um, and I can do that in Wellington because of people like you, because you're my friends, you're friends for the future, um, you're people who've been around me and with me for years and I can feel my emotion drowning. But I tell you what, we would like to sing for you as a final song, a song that um, is really about moving forwards. Because it's actually quite hard looking back. Um, it can be quite painful, but you need to learn it for yourself. I didn't realise that I belonged to so many organisations. Um, as I said, some of them were short-lived. So we're going to sing this last song for you and with you to wrap up tonight. I mean, it's called we're going to keep on walking forward. Come on, girls. Anyone else want to sing this up here? Or you can sing from your seats. It's a lovely song. And as soon as you hear it, you will um, find it easy enough to sing along to, I think. <coughs> Shall I have a quick sip of water? Yes. <laughs> We're all trying to get in the back row. Yeah. <laughs> 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 sorry, back row. I okay. feel very sorry for people who actually um, are musicians and so forth. There's a number of real musicians and singers here, and they have it quite difficult with me because I'm a street singer, really. So um, they've learned that they get me to sing the first thing, and then whatever note it is, they'll do it, which is really clever of them. <coughs> so here we go. We're going to keep on walking forward. Keep on walking forward. Keep on walking forward. Never turning back. Never turning back. We're going to keep on walking proudly. Keep on walking proudly. Across our borders, reach across.